Systems of linear equations arise naturally when scientists, engineers, or economists, or, or others, of course, whenever they study um, flow of certain quantities through a network of some kind, um, you know, for example, suppose an urban planner or maybe a traffic engineer is trying to monitor the patterns of traffic flow in certain grids of city streets, right? Uh, we, we monitor the cars going in, we monitor the cars going out, and this information can help them as they do their city planning and such. Or imagine an electrical engineer wants to calculate the current flow through some electrical circuits. Or maybe uh, an economist is trying to analyze the distribution of products from a manufacturer to consumer um, throughout a network of wholesalers or uh, realtor, realtor, retailers and the such, right? Um, so for networks, the system of equations uh, in play often involve hundreds or even thousands of variables and equations. This thing's quite quite the case. We're gonna look at just much smaller examples. But the basic idea here is that commonly in the sciences, you have conservation laws of some kind, that the amount of things going in is equal to the amount of things going out. And whenever you have a conservation law, balancing that conservation nearly always leads to setting up a system of linear equations. So in this video, I wanna do an example of that with balancing um, a chemical reaction. Uh, so imagine uh, we have some uh, some chemical compounds that are coming together, they react with one another, and then they produce some things. So basically you have some type of reactants that maybe come together, and these can get really complicated, of course, but let's just say we have just two reactants. Uh, we have two chemical compounds that react with each other, and then they produce a product of some kind. And, and, and for this example, we have two products. Uh, so we have a product plus a product. So the conservation law is that the number of atoms entering the system is gonna be the same as the number exiting the system. That is to say, we have the same number of carbons from start to finish. We have the same number of hydrogens, the same number of oxygens, or what other, you know, whatever elements are in play right here. And so for this simple example, I want you to consider uh, this diagram that's on the screen. So our reactants are gonna be CH4. Um, C here stands for carbon, H stands for hydrogen, O stands for oxygen, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the chemical notation here. Uh, so CH4, this is your, this is your methane uh, gas. O2, uh, this is our standard oxygen molecule. These are re our reactants, they combine together um, to create carbon dioxide, CO2, and water, H2O. Now, trying to balance, like, well, how many, how many molecules do we have on the left-hand side versus the right-hand side, it leads naturally to a system of linear equations, for which basically we're going to come up with a three-vector that keeps track of how much carbon, how much hydrogen, how much oxygen is in the system from left to right. Um, and then our variables here are going to keep track of how many molecules we had of each thing. So X1 will keep track of how many molecules of methane did we have. X2 will keep track of how many molecules of oxygen. X3 will keep track of the number of molecules of CO2. And then lastly, X4 will, will be counting the number of molecules of water in play. And so with these variables and vectors in, in consideration, then this then this right here naturally leads to a vector equation. So we have X1 times, now let's read this here. We have one carbon, four hydrogens, no oxygen. So that's our methane vector. Then we're gonna have an oxygen vector, which has no carbon or hydrogen, but it has two, uh, two uh, oxygen atoms there. And so that's the, that's the left-hand side, that's the reactant side. The product side, we then do it for CO2, carbon dioxide. We have X3 times, you have one carbon, no hydrogen, two oxygen, and you have then also the water in play here, for which you're going to have X4 times no carbon, two hydrogen, one oxygen. And so when you see, when you compare these things, right, um, on the reactant side, all of the oxygen is from the oxygen molecule, carbon and hydrogen are just together with the methane, but when then it's over, right, all of the carbon lives with the carbon dioxide, all of the hydrogen lives with the water, but then the wa then the oxygen got broke up into two places and such. And so if you just count, it's like, oh, I have two oxygen on the left, and then you have three oxygen on the, on the right. It can get a little bit confusing how to balance all these things, but this vector equation takes care of it naturally. Um, and then so combining, uh, you, you can, I should say, translating this 
vector equation into a system of equations, you get something like the following. You're going to get x1 plus, well, 0x2. Uh, so I just actually leave it blank, I guess. Then on the right-hand side, just looking at the, just looking at the carbon, right? Um, you're going to get x3 um, and then no x4, right? So that's why I said earlier, all of the carbon from the methane is going to end up with the carbon dioxide. Uh, but then what about the hydrogen, right? So you're going to have 4x1, looking at now the second entry, uh, you have no x2. On the right-hand side, you have no x3, but then you're going to have two times x4, like so. So again, like I said, all of the hydrogen that was originally part of the methane is going to be part of the water when we're done. Finally, you'll get a third equation for the oxygen inside of this problem here, for which no oxygen came from the methane. All of the oxygen came from the, from the oxygen molecule, so you get 2x2. But on the right-hand side, you're going to have 2x3, and then you're going to have 1x4, like so. For which then, when we put in the standard form we do, we put all the variables on the one side. You're going to get x1 minus x3 is equal to 0. You're going to get 4x1 minus 2x4. That's equal to 0. And then you're going to have 2x2 minus 2x3 uh, minus x4 is equal to 0. And so then this final system of linear equations, we can see that it's, first of all, it's a homogeneous system of equations. Uh, we talked about that in the previous video. Uh, homogeneous systems that you have zeros all on the right-hand side, they're always consistent. Now, of course, the trivial solution doesn't really tell you much. Um, you're gonna, if you could put zero in for everything, like if you have no molecules whatsoever, uh, that is a balanced equation. Sort of silly, but that is a possibility. Um, what else could there be? Well, notice this system of equations uh, this system of equations is underdetermined. We have more variables than equations. We have three equations, four variables. So what that tells us is there's at least one free variable in this system. And if you solve this system of equations, you in fact do get one, one free variable. Um, let's say that free variable is X1, the amount of methane in the system. And that kind of makes sense because it depends on how much stuff you want. You could There's a reaction you could do where you have one mole of methane or two moles of methane. That's not a problem. That's a possibility. So that free variable allows for that adjustment. You could have a larger or smaller quantity of methane in play here. But once we've determined the number of methane, like one mole or two moles of methane, that will then force all the others to be what they are. So like if we have one mole of methane, uh, then you're going to have to have two moles of oxygen, one mole of carbon dioxide, and two moles of water. Uh, those other variables are dependent upon that. And so if we leave in the free variable, that gives us the general solution that depended upon, say, the number of moles of methane, which you could do other, other variables, could be the free variables if you want to. But we then would write the general solution as, well, here's the list of the free variables. And then the dependent variables are combinations of the other ones. So like, for example, X1 and X3, they're the same. So however many moles of methane will be the number of carbon dioxide you have here. If you take the second equation divided by two, um, you see that the moles... Uh, the mole you have for for uh, methane will be half of the moles you get for X4. And then you can also ascertain that X2 and X4 are the same as well. And that's how one gets it without actually solving the system of equations. And so this was a pretty simple uh, chemical reaction here. But for even more complicated chemical reactions, these linear systems come into play. And thus solving those linear systems can help a chemist balance uh, these chemical equations.